Hello and welcome to the Car Care channel. So in today's video, we're starting something new on the channel. You guys have requested that you want to see more hands-on me working on cars and diagnosis and all this stuff. So we're gonna start a segment. I'll try to make videos as I have cars to work on. Behind me is a 2010 Prius with a concern. We're gonna look at the concern. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you how I diagnose this concern and then we're gonna fix it and verify everything is taken care of and life is good. But before we get started, if you're new to the channel, welcome, consider subscribing to the channel, check out some of my other videos. If you are a returning subscriber, thank you so much for watching another one of my videos and without further ado, let's get to work. So let's talk about the concern first. This 2010 Prius actually belongs to a viewer who brought me the car. The concern they have is whenever the gasoline engine is running, there is a vibration, like a heavy vibration on a steady cruise. As long as the engine is running, as soon as the engine shuts off, life is good and everything is smooth. If you accelerate harder, everything is good. Now, the first thing I come to mind is torque converter shutter. This is a classic example of a torque converter shutter. Well, this is a uh, Prius hybrid, there's no torque converter. So from experience, and this is how diagnosis starts at a dealership level, you have a lot of experience with these cars and you tend to know their common problems and you start checking those first. Of course, not always the case. Sometimes you'll have uh, odd problems or new problems sometimes, but you start with the obvious, you start with the simple. Now, if you uh, Google anything about 2010 to 2015 Prius, the first problem that is super common is EGR problems. Now the EGR valve is very simple, takes the gas from the exhaust, recycles it, burns it back in the intake, but before it takes that hot gas and dumps it in the intake, it cools it down, there's a little cooler, and then everything goes back in the, into the intake and back to the cylinder just to recycle that exhaust gas for emissions. It's all, that's all it does, it's all emissions, doesn't affect anything else. So what happens with these is over time, they start carbonating up and the valve sticks. Every time the valve sticks open at lower RPM, even this is even in non-hybrids, you're gonna have poor running. And if it sticks open at idle, it'll actually kill the engine because that's too much air coming in and the computer can't compensate fast enough. So the first thing we wanna do in this is, there's a small trick to actually isolate the EGR system and then you'll be able to know exactly for sure this is a problem or we have another problem. So I'm gonna take some other stuff off. I'm gonna take the intake so we can get a good shot at where I want you to check. But just for reference, you can actually do this test on your car. This also not only applies to Prius, it also applies to your second generation Camry Hybrid. Also has the same problem with the EGR. You can simply do the same thing. So let me take you over. I'll take a few things out. I'll take mainly the intake out and we'll take a look at what I, how I diagnose these problems. Let's take the intake and the air box and everything so I can show you better. Aftermarket air filter. It's clean, so we're going to move on. When you take cars apart, as a, as a professional, you're always going to be inspecting things as you take apart. I take an air filter, it's dirty, I'm going to write it down, recommend it. If they don't want it, we'll put the same one back, but this is how a way to save money for the customer. If I'm taking something out that I see a problem with, we're not gonna charge you labor because we're taking it out anyways, but this will be a time to say something about it. So I got the intake out. Let me zoom in and show you the EGR valve. Guys, here's the EGR valve, and there's a hose going from the EGR valve to the intake. It's just that's how the Prius is designed. In order for you to show you better, I'll pull this EVAP line out so you can see it. This is what I'm referring to, this connection right here. So here's what we're gonna do. Very simple way to diagnose these problems where you're 100% sure what's going on and there's no more doubt or throwing parts or whatever is isolate the EGR system. And the easiest way to do this on this or the Camry, the ones that are notorious for this, is to put a small blade, block the path to the EGR, and then drive the car or try to duplicate your symptom. If it's rough running or some of these will 
misfire really bad when they're cold and then it'll come back to life. If you block this and everything all of a sudden goes away, you know for a fact that we have a problem with the EGR system. So very simple, don't even take it out completely out. I'm just gonna loosen the bolts, take the, one, the top one out, loosen this one, take this one out all the way, take my blade, just gonna install it like so. Now, I have to give you one warning. You can tighten your other bolt. That's it. Here's a close up how that went. So you can see it. One thing I will tell you about this diagnosis method. This is for diagnosis only. Don't be tempted to block this permanently and call it a day. Oh, I don't have emission test. I'm just gonna block it and call it a day. Do not do that. You could cause some serious damage here. Do not do that. This is not the right way. Remember, this is wood. We're not gonna do this. This is for diagnosis purposes only. Now, I'm not gonna show you the test drive and everything because we wanna make this short. I test drove the car and everything is perfectly fine. There is a lot of misconception about the EGR system and let's talk about them for a bit. Now you guys read all over the internet, clean the EGR valve, clean the, the cooler and the intake and all that stuff. That's perfectly fine if you are doing this on your own car. I am not working on my own car. I am not a DIY mechanic. I am a professional. When people take their cars to a professional, they expect the car to be fixed right the first time, not the sixth time, or worse, never fixed. However, what differentiates dealership mechanics from independent mechanics, and this is not to knock them down, hear me out here, Dealership mechanics are held at a higher standard, not because they are special and because they, you know, they are this hierarchy. No, because you only work on one brand. You have access to all the tools, all the training, and all the equipment, and you only work on one brand. Independent mechanics, they don't have access sometimes to the tools, to the resources, to the training. They're out there working on every single brand in the world and they have to figure out everything from scratch. So, when you go to a dealership, you should expect first time repairs. That doesn't happen all the time, but because of that, here's what technicians, professional mechanics at a dealership would do. I am not going to take the EGR valve and clean it. People will jump at the comments while well, you're robbing the customer, this and that. Well, here's the problem, the customer. This is not my personal car. These people are trusting me with their car to fix it the right way. First time though, they're done. I gave them the option. Do you want to clean the parts? But just know I will charge you and then your problem could come back in a week, a month, a year. I can't tell you because we did not replace parts. We cleaned them. There's so much time, how many times you can clean that EGR valve, then it's fit mechanically stuck and it's done. Or you can buy new parts and then it's guaranteed to work because it's a new part. Your call, your money, your car. I just do as you say, but if you ask my opinion, do it once and be done with it. I always ask people, how long are you keeping this car? If you're only keeping this car for six months, let's clean the thing and be done with it and whatever happens, happens. But if you're keeping this car, in the case of this car, they are keeping the car for long. So I'm actually gonna replace the EGR valve. I'm gonna take a look at the cooler. Usually the coolers, people spend so much time cleaning the coolers and actually they rarely get blocked. Sorry to say that, most people dunk them in fluid and clean them and shine them. And guess what? As soon as you start the car, it's all gonna get dirty again. It's exhaust, it's the nastiest place in a car after the combustion chamber. So I'm not gonna be shining stuff and cleaning this. However, from experience, and this is, ask me how I know this because I've been down this road before. This symptom with the Prius where it, it hesitates or shakes, vibrates at low acceleration is almost always caused by the EGR valve first and then in combination with the EGR valve, the intake manifold. So I actually have an intake manifold. Let me bring it over and I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. Here's an intake manifold out of a Prius. Here's how the EGR is gonna work. That's the pipe that I put the thing to block it. Here it is. It goes into the intake right here. And then, and then if you notice really close, 
there are four openings. These four openings. This is actually where the passage of this goes through and goes into the cylinder. And you notice there's one for each cylinder. Now here's what happens with these Priuses. Two of these passages, and usually the first two, or sometimes the last two, get clogged. And now you have uneven EGR pressure going in. And that causes that misfire because you have one cylinder is getting too much air and one cylinder is getting nothing. So it just causes an imbalance and that's what the shake is. But the reason all this is happening to begin with is because the EGR valve is letting air in when it's not supposed to at lower load, lower RPM, or worse, when the engine is just idling. So this whole problem starts with the EGR valve and then it makes its way here. How I know that we need to address this as well, because we've been burned by this. I have customer cars coming to the dealership. Sure, it's the EGR valve, especially when it was under a campaign. By the way, Toyota did cover this for some time for free, but we replaced the EGR valve and then two days later, customers back, hey, it's still doing it. It's a little better, but it still does it here. It just doesn't feel right because the ports are clogged. So now when the EGR runs when it's supposed to run, it's gonna not run even. It's gonna cause that shake again at a different operation, not exactly the same where it's that low cost, but it's still there. And that's how the customers don't, you, you can't tell customers and when you're a professional, you can't tell them, oh, well, we did this, but now let's try it. You can't do that. They're just gonna look at you like, you're robbing me at this point. And I understand that. From experience, because I am a theatership technician and I've been through this and we've been burned by this, I told the owner of this car, we're gonna either try to clean the intake. The intake's very difficult to clean because you can't really get in there and clean it 100%. Again, ask me how I know that, we've tried that. The EGR valve, I don't like cleaning EGR valves because there's a motor and that valve needs to seal properly. It's not like the cooler or the pipes, even this. But I haven't had good luck cleaning the intake for that specific problem, not the rattle in the morning. So we're gonna clean, replace the EGR valve. I'm gonna take a quick look at the cooler. If it's not plugged, don't be surprised. I'm not gonna start cleaning it because I see people on the internet taking the cooler, shining it up, putting it in solutions and Folks, as soon as you start the car, drive it for a mile, it's gonna be exactly the same as you what, what you clean. We're not looking for shining clean here. This is exhaust, it's never gonna be clean. We're looking for non-obstructed, not clogged. So let me go ahead, I'll pull the cowl. It makes life much easier. For me, the cowl takes a few minutes to pull out anyways. It makes life much easier. So I can take that with EGR valve. We'll take a look, then I'll take the intake manifold. We'll take a look at that. But we, I am replacing the intake. I am replacing the EGR valve. So that's where we're heading at this point after we block the EGR when we verify that this is indeed our problem. Let's pull the cowl. So at this point, I want to remove the intake manifold. I'm going to take this hose out, we'll take our blade out, and then we'll work on the EGR valve last. But let me take this out of the way, we'll give us more room to work. The PCV valve is right behind here. When you pull the intake, it's still held up by the hose that goes to the PCV valve. So maybe if you're do, ever doing this, replace it. Here's the hose that goes to the PCV valve. PCV valve is right here. Very simple, it's right there. So here is what we have. What have we here? Look at this. This does not look good at all. See those ports? This one, especially this one. So cylinder number three, that's plugged up completely. All right, so I'm gonna remove the EGR valve. Small disclaimer, I'm a professional. I do this for a living. The methods you're gonna see me remove this with, not conventional methods, but remember, 
There was a time where we were removing 10, 15 of these a day. So we found a lot of ways to uh, get this thing out without having to disassemble the whole thing because Toyota only covered the valve itself in a software update. Aha, software update. We'll talk about that in a bit when we do it in this car, when we're done here. So let me go ahead and remove the uh, EGR valve. You'll see it. Leave your comment below, what do you think? Let's go ahead and do this. Here's that EGR valve. You can see it's pretty badly carboned up. Folks, you can clean these. They might work. Some people will come jump in the comments and say, oh, they work. Again, I, this is not my car. I have to fix this 100% where it doesn't come back in a month, a year, whatever the case may be. And the only way to do that is to put a brand new valve. And I actually recommend you always do. Toyota's repair, official repair, is to replace the valve only intake if needed and do the software update. They never say anything about the cooler, which I am looking at it right now. Looks pretty ugly. So I'm gonna take the back out. We're gonna blow it out. We'll call it a day. That's it. We're not uh, shining this up because this is exhaust. You can't shine the exhaust up on the inside. All right, we're good. That's that. You saw the cloud and the mess and the whole nine yards. And somebody in the comments is going to come to me and tell me, you know, that is not healthy. You shouldn't be doing that. Well, you should work in an automotive shop and see that this is nothing. Let's put the whole thing back together. How about that? All right, so here's the new two EGR valve. I'm gonna put it on. I just started the studs and the nuts. I take the studs and the nuts out to get this a little looser so we can get it out of the way and clean it. But I wanna tell you one thing. If you go buy this part off of the parts department, it's very expensive. But if you actually go and look up the TSB, they have a number for a kit that comes with the valve and a few gaskets. Now, this is a PCV valve. I'm gonna replace it because while we're, we're here, let's go, just go ahead and throw one on. But it comes with all the gaskets you need to replace the valve, except the gasket in the back. Folks, these are metal gaskets. You can reuse them. Just letting you know, if you are in a cringe and you didn't get the right gaskets, you can re reuse all of them, except the black ones. The black ones, sometimes from age, like some of that black paint will come off and now you'll have an uneven surface. If you see that, replace them. Otherwise, you're good to reuse them. The kit is a lot cheaper than you're just buying the gas, the valve alone. Just thought I'd let you know this, so always look for the kit number. Let's go ahead and install the valve. So here's a, a little trick. I gotta install this nut back there, all the way to the bottom of the cooler. I don't have a magnetic socket at home. Of course, I bring tools from work and I have some tools here, but I don't have all the magnetic sockets and all this stuff. So here's a mechanic tip for you. You wanna make this a magnetic socket, take a little piece of electrical tape, put it on, on the tip of the socket like so, sticky, type toward, sticky side towards the socket, and then take your nut and just kinda Put it in there, that's it, it ain't going nowhere. Now you have yourself a uh, homemade magnetic socket. Now when you tighten this and pull it, it's actually gonna, the tape will stick to the socket and it won't stay there. So thought I'd throw this one in so for you guys. Let's put this in. All right, at this point, EGR valve is back, life's good. I'm gonna go ahead and replace this PCB valve, put the intake. I'm gonna put the whole car back together real quick 
and then we'll talk about the software update. All right, so the repair is done. Now we're gonna do the software update. Folks, the software update is part of the TSB. When you do a repair, you gotta complete the TSB to its completion because Toyota sometimes will make software updates to prevent this issue from happening again in the near future and you gotta do the full repair. They will update the part. They will also update the software. So we got TechStream right here. We're gonna go ahead and update the software in case you haven't seen a software update on a Toyota, it's the simplest thing in the world. Download a little file, text stream, open the file, connect a 12 volt source, battery charger that doesn't shut off automatically, power source, the official uh, tool from Toyota that the battery charger also does that. So I got a charger on the car that we use for software updating. It's just a power supply, it's really not a charger is a supply steady voltage to the computer because if the voltage drops in the middle of the update, there goes your computer. So let me go ahead with the update and actually the update will tell you what kind of voltage we got. So it's telling you turn off the key, hit next, we gotta wait 10 seconds, that's just how the update process goes. Then it'll tell you the battery voltage so you can verify that your jumper is connected. We got 13.8 volts. Let me turn on the key. Usually the, the voltage will drop a little bit. So it's right at 13.5. I'm happy with that. Let's hit next. Start. Now processing and then the update will be on its way. It usually takes a little bit of time to start. It'll calculate the time looks right about just under one minute. It's really not a big deal. We're just gonna wait for it to update. In the meantime, folks, when you do any repairs or any Toyota, you always have to follow the repair to its completion, not just throw some parts or clean some parts and call it a day. Replace what they want you to replace using the part numbers in the TSBs, because Toyota have been known to update parts and make a service kit that has potentially a different part than what you would get out of just regular parts or online. So always follow the repair to its completion. Make sure any software update, folks, I know not anybody has, has access to these software updates, but you can go to the dealership. They're not expensive. You can just specifically tell them, I want the update for this, for this TSB. I've already done the repair, so I have the TSB. Give them the TSB. So they might give you resistance. You know, you're just coming off like that and you didn't, they didn't do any repairs and they don't know what's what, but this is where it helps to know someone at the dealership. Technician, advisor, they'll help you out. You know, you do the repair, hey man, could you update this computer for me? Charge you probably an hour, and life is good. Uh, the update's already halfway. We'll finish the update, we'll go test drive the car, make sure everything is good, and I'll test drive the car one more time before I give it back to the owner. And that's one repair completed. I hope this video was helpful and informative. I know it's not step-by-step step how to replace the EGR. There's hundreds of videos out there, but I wanted to give you is first the diagnosis tip. How to diagnose all this? Because I see so many people misdiagnose a bad EGR valve for a head gasket or vice versa. They'll think it's an EGR valve. Waste all their money because you have a misfire on cold start and then it ends up being a head gasket. Just thought I'd let you know the definitive way to know if it's an EGR problem or something else. I also gave you some tips and tricks and you saw me working. A lot of you have been to my regular view as this is, if you're still watching. 
You guys have asked me, we want some hands-on, we want to see you working on cars. Well, there you go, we did a job. If you guys like this kind of videos, let me know. I mean, I get side jobs here and there. I will film them at home and uh, we'll show you tips and tricks. Also, another one is if you don't have magnetic sockets, and I have magnetic sockets in every size imaginable, but it work. I can't just drag all my tools here every time I have a side job. So I have some tools at home, but not everything, not the little specialty stuff. So you learn to make these little sockets, you know, put the little tape and now you have a magnetic socket. I hope this was helpful for you. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, you're still watching. Well, thank you so much for still watching and consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. And until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you and you have a wonderful day.